Hi, y'all. Let's chat a little bit about birthright citizenship because it's in the news. Uh, the president has said that he's contemplating issuing an executive order that purports to curtail birthright citizenship for certain uh, people born in the United States. So it's a very interesting topic, and it's not one that's resolved. Now, uh, I see back and forth a lot of people say, oh, it's absolutely uh, the case that birthright citizenship does not extend to non-citizens, uh, to illegal aliens. On the other side, uh, you have people who have a very expansive view of the 14th Amendment, and they think it applies everywhere within the United States without, uh, without restriction. The issue is that it's a little bit more difficult to parse what exactly it means than that, because there are conflicting lines of authority in the case law. And uh, one way you could read it is you could just read the term, you know, words on the page that are written right there and say, well, it says, uh, purports to say, and does in fact say, all persons born within the United States... Uh, and that's where one part of the argument will stop, and then they'll say, therefore, everyone, uh, ipso facto, is a, a birthright citizen if they were born uh, with, you know, within the geographic borders, within the limits of the United States. They always, uh, not always, but often like to forget the second part, subject to the jurisdiction thereof, are citizens of the United States in the states wherein they reside. Uh, so, when these cases, or cases on citizenship, or any other case goes before the court, it's important to remember that the court will assume certain background things to be true uh, because they are not contested and are not facts in the case. So, for example, if you have a statute that purports to make, I don't know, running counterclockwise in the middle of a street a crime, uh, but no one is challenging it on a constitutional ground, they're just saying, well, actually, my client ran counterclockwise, which doesn't violate the statute, the court will have no occasion to pass on the constitutional question. So it will assume, for the sake, for the purposes of that case, that the statute is validly enacted unless it is challenged by a person who is falling prey to, uh, or is, you know, in some sense being inconvenienced by an application or an alleged application of that law. So it's this is the uh, the theory of constitutional avoidance, uh, which says that if it's not necessary to decide a constitutional question, it's necessary not to decide that question. So you only decide them if you absolutely have to. Uh, with any given case. And if you can avoid it, then you just address the statute and give people the remedies uh, that f you know, that would come under the statute. So if the person was running counterclockwise and the law only says you can't run clockwise, that person wouldn't fall within the strictures and so they'd be free to go. However, the conviction would stand if it turns out he was running the right direction and then you'd have to wait later for some other case where the person's challenging whether or not the government has the power to outlaw that in the first place. So when these cases go up before the Supreme Court, or in the courts generally, about who is or isn't a citizen of the United States within the meaning of the constitutional text, um, you are looking at certain things and not looking at certain other things. So in all the cases that have come up that are relevant here, the person who is challenging that you know, a decision that they're not a citizen of the United States is a person who was here lawfully, whether it be an American Indian, who you know they do live here lawfully, or whether it be a Chinese immigrant who is on some kind of visa to be here as a resident worker, something like that, they are all lawfully within the United States. There's no question about whether or not they have a right to be here or whether or not the government has acquiesced in their being here. So there's no need, there's been no occasion for the Supreme Court to pass on what would be the result if the person were here unlawfully. Now, um, as just a plain matter, it, the 14th Amendment, the provision at issue, can't literally mean everyone born within the United States because it says, and subject to the jurisdiction thereof. This necessarily excludes consular officials and their families. A diplomat here is not subject to the jurisdiction of the United States. So even though they are physically present within in the United States, there's a legal fiction that they are considered to be either outside of the territory of the United States, but in any event, they are certainly not subject to the jurisdiction of the United States, within some very limited exceptions. Diplomatic immunity doesn't literally cover every uh, kind of thing that happens under the law. Uh, diplomats are subject to four types of lawsuits. They can be issued uh, petty uh, summonses for like parking violations or speeding or, or whatever, where the little payment is a different issue. So diplomatic immunity is not a complete immunity from all legal process, just an immunity from almost all legal process. So in some sense, they're still subject to the jurisdiction of the states because they can, uh, of the United States, because they can be held into court to answer for certain kinds of uh, civil offenses, but uh, uh, civil lawsuits. But in any event, just say that it's a blanket um, immunity from all laws, all possible laws in the United States, they wouldn't be covered. And then you have the question about what, what's the case with these American Indians? Uh, they are clearly legally within the United States, 
but they don't have uh, any loyalty necessarily to the United States. Their uh, immediate allegiance is to their tribe, not to the United States, even though the, the uh, reservations are within the geographic boundaries of the United States and are subject to the laws of Congress, as it says in the Constitution. It's one of those peculiar cases. And there was a case called Elk v. Wilkins, where uh, a Native American, an American Indian, had uh, disavowed his allegiance to his tribe and was claiming, I'm therefore a citizen of the United States. And the Supreme Court says, no, you can't by your own force declare yourself to be a citizen of the United States. Without, the, uh, without some treaty being uh, written by the Congress, uh, without some statute being written by the Congress saying that, you know, under, you know, under some naturalization law, you will hereby become a citizen of the United States. You can't do it on your own force. It requires the consent and action by the Congress. So later on, the Congress did uh, naturalize. They, they did give citizenship to all the American Indians in the United States. And uh, so that uh, settled that issue. Now, I've gotten some pushback on my position because someone says the, uh, actually, I've heard this a couple times, the uh, Congress having enacted a statute that gave that granted citizenship to all of these Indians made obsolete or rendered irrelevant in some sense the Supreme Court decision in, in the Elk case. That's not true. Uh, Supreme Court decisions do not disappear because Congress has enacted a statute. And it was particularly amusing because the, the person said that um, the fact that Congress did it is a, re is a is refuting, is a repudiation of that Supreme Court case, the Elk case. They can't possibly be because the Supreme Court case itself said, your remedy lies in Congress. If you want to be a citizen, you got to go talk to the Congress. They went to talk to the Congress. Congress said, you know, that is a fantastic idea. We'll, we'll naturalize uh, all the Indians. Ta-da! So the issue doesn't arise anymore on a constitutional level because of the existence of a statute. So anyone who would like to sue under, uh, on that issue would have a statute in hand to come to the court. But when the statute didn't exist, all they had was the Constitution itself, and the Constitution itself, the Supreme Court says, just doesn't cover you, you're shit out of luck, sorry. But then a couple of years later came another case, and it was uh, United States versus uh, Ark. Um, Wong Kim Ark, I think it is. And then it, it discusses... Uh, these two cases are mentioned in uh, on the Wikipedia article, the Elk case and the Ark case. Uh, a couple of other cases that are relevant, one of which is uh, Scott v. Sanford, the dreaded Dred Scott decision, which happened before the 13th, 14th, and 15th amendments were ratified. But then you have the Slaughterhouse cases, which happened after these amendments were ratified. And the Slaughter, I'm sorry, the, San the Scott case says the Congress doesn't have the power to make, uh, the government can't make citizens people who weren't considered citizens before, that's beyond their power, and then they uh, did some other things with respect to uh, granting freedom to slavery and free state. Anyway, whatever. So that was struck down, but then the Civil War happened, and the post-Civil War amendments happened. Now, when a uh, court overrules its holdings in a case, it can overrule uh, only such parts of those cases as was held, and leave uh, other holdings of the case in place. But in this case, a constitutional amendment after a civil, actually several constitution amendments, were enacted. Uh, they were ratified, which wiped out parts of the uh, the Scott v. Sanford thing. But they were still a uh, case. But it was still quoted in subsequent uh, subsequent cases. The reasoning, not the holding, because the reasoning remained uh, remained germane. In fact, the plaintiff in the Elk case was trying to invoke some clauses from the the Scott v. Sanford decision, the Dred Scott decision, to say, "Look, this supports me." And in the Elk, they're saying, "No, it doesn't." Chief, Chief Justice Taney writing for the court did not say that it did this, it did not say it did that, did not say it did the other, it said quite the opposite. So on that rationale, uh, you, you lose on that rationale, but then, you know, to address the merits of the case, they go on. And uh, so they said the decision in Elk v. Wilkins concerned only uh, members of the Indian tribes within the United States and had no tendency to deny citizenship to children born of people of Caucasian, African, or Mongolian descent, not in the diplomatic service of a foreign country. Now, when people who say that uh, birthright citizenship it applies to everyone within the United States want to read through the cases, assuming they do, normally they just have talking points they spout out that are unrelated to any laws that have ever been enacted anywhere in the United States. It's just, my gut feeling is this, therefore that must be what the Constitution says. Uh, they will skim through these cases, and they'll happen upon a line like that and say, see, it only applies to Indians. Okay, it's very important that you understand that cases have facts and subsequent cases have to talk about those facts. But uh, appellate cases do not resolve just that particular case. That's what trial courts are for. Uh, appellate courts take um, cases and other cases that are similar to it and establish like some blanket rule of law 
that will apply to similar types of cases. It happens to be the case that it was an Indian suing, and it happened to be that they were here lawfully. And the next case I'm going to talk about, the art case, it happens to be these Chinese people were here lawfully. Uh, so the court in none of these cases had to deal with what happens with respect to a person who is here without the permission of the, of the government. They are here unlawfully. Say they're spies. Certainly a spy does not, uh, they, well, let me go on and read. Um, so it says, the real object of the 14th Amendment of the Constitution and qualifying words, all persons born in the United States by the addition of and subject to the jurisdiction thereof would appear to have uh, been to exclude by the fewest and fittest words, besides children of members of the Indian tribe standing in a peculiar relation to the national government, unknown to the common law, two ca uh, classes of cases. Children born of alien enemies in hostile occupation and children of diplomatic representatives of some foreign country, people who owe their allegiance uh, to some other country, both of which have already been shown by the law of England and by our own law uh, from, time to time of the first, from the time of the first settlement of the English colonies in America had, uh, had been recognized exception to the fundamental rule of citizenship by birth within the country. So they'll read that and say, see, this supports the idea that it only applies to uh, an invading army and the people who are with that and uh, diplomats and you know uh, whether or not they have children here. And then with the, um, with the peculiar and only edition of the uh, American Indians. So the foregoing considerations and authorities irresistibly lead us to this conclusion. The 14th Amendment affirms uh, the ancient fundamental rule of citizenship by birth within the territory in the allegiance and under the protection of the country, including all children here born of resident aliens with the exceptions of qual and qual or qualifications, uh, ones with the common law I just mentioned, sovereign, uh, children of foreign sovereigns and their ministers, uh, invading armies, that, that kind of thing, um, uh, born on foreign public ships or enemies within and during a hostile occupy, occupation of our territory. And with the single exception of children of members of Indian tribes owing direct allegiance to their several tribes. Uh, so it's, it then goes on to say, and this is what's ruinous to their argument that it, it covers all people who are born within, all other people born within the geographical limits of the United States, within the sovereign power of the United States. The amendment, in clear words, uh, and in manifest intent, includes children born within the territory of the United States, I'm sorry, within the uh, territory of the United States, of all other persons of whatever race or color, domiciled within the United States, every citizen or subject of another country, while domiciled here is within the allegiance and the protection and consequently subject to the jurisdiction of the United States. So they've talked about domiciled. Domiciled is a legal term. It doesn't mean, you know, has a house or something. It means lawfully present with the permission of uh, the legal authority. So they are taking it as a background assumption of this case that the people are otherwise, they are here, uh, however they got here, they are otherwise here lawfully. And with the notorious, uh, it's, it's known to the government, uh, it's no secret to the government, and the government has acquiesced in their physical presence. If you take it to mean literally every person born and subject to the jurisdiction of the United States, it would mean everybody within the territorial waters of the United States, which is a 12, uh, 12 miles off of our shore. So someone transiting on a ship who happens to cross that magic boundary in the middle of the ocean could become a citizen of the United States by their parents giving birth on a cruise ship or a fishing ship or something that just happens to, for the moment, drift into our territorial waters. If you really want to push the envelope, that, that it literally means everyone, except for the ones that commonly understood to be ex exempted, uh, diplomats and you know, invading, invading and occupying uh, hostile armies, then it could go as far out as 200 miles off of the shore where we have an exclusive economic zone by which we have exclusive dominion under all of the material wealth under the ocean. So the person floating above it would be in international waters, but they are literally floating above an area over which the United States exclusively exercises uh, some jurisdiction. No other sovereign in the world has the power to exclude there. Jurisdiction means power to exclude, power to make an unreviewable decision. Unreviewable by whom? By any court not constituted by the governing entity. And there is no court anywhere in the world except the United States who has dominion over the seabed and the minerals and everything there 200 miles out from our shores. And it's not just the continental United States. It'd be around Alaska, all of our possessions and territories. So if you literally think that it means everyone born with, within the United States, 
Certainly, many of our possessions, all of our possessions, are, if you're there, you're within the, the uh, jurisdiction of the United States and in the United States. And if you don't believe that you are, just get an army and go there and say, we claim this for ourselves. Uh, you will find out very quickly that the United States does, in fact, consider that to be part of the United States. But even if some of the outlying possessions aren't considered within in the United States for purposes of the 14th Amendment, some of them most certainly are, like the Northern Marianas Islands, where Congress absolutely uh, does not grant birthright citizenship to every person who's been born there. It's only back to a certain year before which they say no, even though before that year it was still part of the United States uh, while this deal is being worked out. And you have a series of cases called the Insular Cases, which have some, like the Rebang, well, not the Rebang case, the Rebang cases made, interpreting it from the Ninth Circuit, about people born in various outlying territories which where citizenship is conferred by birth, and they're saying, no, it still doesn't apply to you. And what made the decision about whether it does or doesn't apply to you? Congress's action. Congress has made a determination here, yes, there, no. Here, yes, under these circumstances, no. Here is some weird uh, um, kind of rubric. If, if it's your mom born here and she lived for a year, yes. If your dad born here lived for two years, yes. It, so this whole big, uh, if this uh, flow chart you have to go through to find out whether or not a person born there would be granted birthright citizenship. But what's driving it there is that Congress has the, the prerogative to say yay or nay uh, for these various kinds of things. And that has, I don't know of any cases where it says, oh no, it turns not in any sense whatever on the Congress. And, in, and uh, federal law today, 8 U.S.C. section 1401, which, gather, which governs birthright citizenship, is what establishes that. Uh, and I think Puerto Rico, Guam, uh, Northern Marianas Islands, the, com the Commonwealth of the Norman Northern Marianas Islands, uh, the continental United States, Alaska, Hawaii, and, and perhaps some others. Uh, but anyway, so some of our possessions, yes. Some of the other possessions, no. Uh, it seems to be ad hoc based on the feeling of Congress. So if these people are right, then Congress has no power at all to stop birthright citizenship under any circumstances. And yet it has never been uh, deemed by any court to be beyond the Congress's power to decide birthright citizenship. Therefore, that means necessarily the 14th Amendment does not by its own force literally apply to all persons born within the United States and subject to its jurisdiction. Now, the Elks case talks about subject to the jurisdiction. It, it doesn't mean subject to the barest degree to the jurisdiction of the United States. Uh, you know, a tourist obviously is subject to the law. They can't come here and commit a murder and be like, well, I'm a tourist, can't arrest me. They're certainly subject to the law. But does that mean they're subject to the jurisdiction of the United States in the sense of the 14th Amendment? No, because that means owing political allegiance immediately and irrevocably to the sovereign. Uh, tourists cannot be conscripted into our military. Lawful permanent residents can be. Uh, both are here tourists are here lawfully, lawful permanent residents are here lawfully, but only one of them is domiciled in the United States. That is, recognized to be a resident with the permission of the United States government within the United States. That's the Chinese cases, uh, the Ark case. He, they were, re they were uh, workers here, the government had let them in, so the government had taken action, just like the Supreme Court had said in the Elks case. Nothing disagrees with it. It says it needs to be by some kind of consent treaty or statute, action on behalf of the government, you're here with its permission in some sense. They were, therefore they're covered, even though they don't have any permanent allegiance to the United States, when they're permanent, when they're permanent, when they're lawful permanent residents, or they're here on some kind of work visa or whatever, they do have a temporary allegiance to the United States. They can be conscripted into the military. They can serve in the military. Tourists cannot. Certainly unlawful residents, I'm sorry, there's no such thing as an unlawful resident, Criminal aliens, illegal aliens, cannot. They cannot be conscripted because they have no allegiance to our government, and they cannot even serve in the military. They aren't good enough. No, we categorically prohibit you, categorically prohibit you because we can't trust you to have allegiance to our government. In fact, the, re the reason that you are here is precisely because you refuse to uh, recognize our sovereign right to say you can't come in. You've decided that you are uh, the final arbiter of what you may and may not do. That is not subjecting yourself to the jurisdiction of the United States in the sense of the 14th Amendment. So it's, uh, you know, it's simply not the case that the amendment of its own force applies to literally everyone who is physically within the, the sovereign jurisdiction of the United States. There are other cases. Um, people who fall within military control of some place in a war zone where the United States has seized it. We cert they are certainly under the jurisdiction of the United States. Uh, the military tribunals can certainly prosecute those people, 
but they're not within the United States, so they don't count. And there are certainly people who are physically within the United States who aren't subject to the jurisdiction of the United States, by which it means allegiance to the United States, who also don't count. And, you know, as I've mentioned, Congress has uh, statutes on this. It, uh, it, it grants citizenship of birthright to certain people in some of our territories, but only back to a certain year. Uh, it doesn't go all the way back to when they joined or became one of our possessions or territories. It's some kind of in-between state, and it's based on Congress's view that maybe one day in the future uh, you'll be an incorporated territory, perhaps you'll be a state, you're on that pathway, we'll see what happens. We're going to do this in degrees and grades, and we're going to say this this time we're going to go back 20 years and uh, you know, grant you birthright citizenship uh, or naturalize you or whatever it is, so that way your children in the future will be citizens, and we'll see how it works out, but if it doesn't work out, then you go away. There are other cases where you'll be conditionally given citizenship, which can be taken away, provisionally given to you by birth, where uh, the government can just take it away. Uh, one of which is, if you're under the, if you're a child who is found within the borders, the, the sovereign territory of the United States, under the age of five, you are granted citizenship by birth, unless it can be shown by the time you're age 21 that you were born elsewhere, in which case the conditional offer goes away. And same with some uh, people born overseas and some of our possessions. It's, uh, you know, you are granted it, um, a conditional citizenship until the age of 26 or 25, I don't remember what it is, uh, provided that you file paperwork. If it were the case that the, the amendment itself uh, automatically, ipso facto, per se, made these people citizens, those laws would be unconstitutional, and yet they have always been upheld. So it simply cannot be the case that uh, it, it means what these people say or think that it means. This is why lawyers litigate laws, not lay people say, oh, well, I read that, and then, you know, if you read the words without any legal knowledge at all, it seems to say this, but in the legal context, the terms of art they have a, a different meaning than would be used in ordinary parlance. And only people, uh, I'm sorry, not only, but people who have some uh, legal training, some training in civics would understand that there's a distinction uh, because the law might seem to be general or universal, but it will be constrained by background understandings and, uh, and other factors, and some of them is when it's a term of art, uh, it, it will have restrictions in, imposed on it. So the Elks case, the Art case, stand for the proposition that even for people who are here uh, openly and notoriously with the consent of the government, sometimes they qualify for citizenship by birth and other times they don't. But what has never been decided is that if you are here unlawfully, that you too are also decided. And it's certainly not in any statute of the United States, and it never has been in any statute in the United States, or at least not that I can tell, and no court case has held otherwise, uh, no, no binding court case has held otherwise that I can find. And I've, I've had to read through, you know, quite a lot of legal writing on this. So, the question then is, uh, ch people who are born to uh, criminal aliens, people who are here illegally, against the consent of the government, even though openly and notoriously here, we know that there are Ill illegal aliens, but we have never acquiesced in their presence, and indeed we have uh, diligently worked every year since you know, laws came into effect on this to, ex to find them, to capture them, and to remove them. Uh, whether they are more closely... Uh, wh which category of cases do they better fit in? The ones where the people are here with the permission of the government, where a law has been written that lets them in, or are they more like it even though they're here... Uh, and we know about it, they still don't quite count for various reasons, like the Indians did. And I say they're more, they're closer to, we know that they are here, but we have not acquiesced in it cases than they are in any of the cases where we know that they're here and have acquiesced in it, which even that, like in the Indian cases, the Indian case, I should say, does not show that you will be granted citizenship by birth. You can still be here lawfully with the full consent of the government, uh, it knows you're here, it has invited you to remain here, it has passed laws that protect you, it is, you know, everyone knows you're there, and they can still say, well, you know, in some cases, not so much. That's true of Indians, that's true of lots of people in our outlying territories, our incorporated territories, have, you know, like this graduated system, and this has been the case for, not since like last week, but for centuries. That is, it's worked this way. Uh, of course, that doesn't really count if it goes back 200 years because the 14th Amendment only came about in the uh, 1860s. But since then, it has certainly been the case that we've had this patchwork of laws uh, throughout the country. And so, I don't think that anyone can say that it's, they're necessarily right that uh, the children of illegal aliens have some 
uh, absolute claim to citizenship. Uh, now, I'm not saying they have no claim because it, no court, uh, no authoritative decision has ever been issued by any court, which means it is an open question. Uh, but the idea, when they claim that, that people like me are idiots and we have no argument, they're absolutely wrong. Uh, there is at least an argument. Now, one of the other things, uh, you know, I put down a whole bunch of case law here, but I didn't want to read it all to you because, you know, legal writing is not the most entertaining writing that's ever existed. I have seen some people, even people who think that there's an arguable case, and they'll say that they think that it's on the Congress to take action. Well, I agree that it's on the Congress to take action on our immigration law, and with respect to birthright citizenship laws, they have taken action, and they have nowhere covered uh, granting citizenship rights by birth to the children of people who are in violation of the law and against the consent of the government present. Um, that gap in the statutory language means that it was left out for a reason. They included a whole bunch of things, and they, they did not include a whole bunch of other things. It's an ordinary principle of statutory, interpret, uh, statutory interpretation. The inclusion of certain things and the exclusion of other things means that the things that are included count and the things that are excluded don't. It, you know, it is um, the, exclusion, the, the inclusion of one excludes all the others. So they included, it seems to be an exhaustive list of things that would count for birthright citizenship, and they did not include a whole bunch of other things. So my argument would be that the things that are included count and to the exclusion of all the things not included. And it's not the role of the court to go filling that in and saying, well, you know, if the, if the Congress had thought, the Congress did think about it. That's why, uh, and the courts have thought about it. That's why they talk about being domiciled here, being in residence here. Those are legal states where the government has said, yes, you may lawfully be here. Now, there is, I'm not going to say there's no language that cuts the, uh, cuts the other side. There is. But as I, uh, as I mentioned, you can't read that in isolation. You have to say, yes, it says there's one part where it says, independently of their residence and intention to uh, maintain it permanently, independently of how they're domiciled. But then right after it, it says, um, actually, let me pull it up. Right after that language, it goes on to say that it deals with respect to the people who are lawfully present, even you know, if they're not lawfully resident. Like, for example, um, this is uh, from referencing the slaughterhouse cases, black, white, blah, 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 whether formerly slaves or not, born or naturalized in the U.S., and, owing no, and uh, emphasized, and owing no allegiance to any alien power, should be citizens of the United States and of the state wherein they reside. So, you know, once again, there's that allegiance kind of talk. The, uh, the talk about the fact that you have come here and voluntarily separated yourself from your previous allegiances isn't sufficient. You need further action. That has to be respected and accepted by the United States itself. Um, it mentioned that previous cases did not resolve whether or not it was uh, necessary uh, to entertain the citizenship of the parents. This is, you know, of uh, the children who are born here. Uh, and that there is some doubt that parents of non-citizens are themselves citizens. But whatever the answer is on that, as the uh, ARC court said, we don't resolve it in this case. So anyone who's citing it for the proposition that it has been resolved is explicitly denying what it is incorporated in its opinion. It's saying, look, there's some doubt about that. We're not answering that question here. That'll have to wait for some kind of future cases. Um... So, for example, it says, right after it, 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 let me read it. So, it talks about a Secretary of State and his opinion, which has been favorably cited by the court, and it says, uh, you know, about them being here, independently of residence with intention, to, with intention to continue such residence, independently of any domiciliation, independently of the taking of any oath of allegiance or of renouncing any former allegiance, it is well known that by the public law an alien or stranger born for so, long as time, for so long a time as he continues within the dominions of a government, owes obedience to the laws of that government, and may be punished for treason, or other crimes, as a native-born subject might be, unless this case is varied by some treaty stipulations. Well, spies can't be tried for treason, they're here unlawfully, uh, even though that would find the face of this apparent language. 
And the reason this apparent language seems much more sweeping than it can actually be held to be is precisely because no one was considering, in this case, what would, what would be the result if the person were here unlawfully. And so, uh, immediately after it says that, it says, whatever consideration in the absence of a controlling provision of the Constitution might influence the legislative or executive branch of the government to decline to admit persons of the Chinese race to the status of citizens of the United States, there are none that can constrain or permit the judiciary to refuse to give full effect to the peremptory and explicit language of the 14th Amendment, which declares and ordains that all persons born or naturalized in the United States and subject to the jurisdiction thereof are citizens of the United States. And here's the, the crucial repudiation of what they said in the paragraph uh, before. Chinese persons born, or not the repudiation, but at least the narrowing, if not the outright rejection of parts of it. Chinese persons born out of the United States, remaining subjects of the Emperor of China, and not having become citizens of the United States, are entitled to the protection and owe allegiance to the United States so long as they are permitted by the United States to reside here and are subject to the jurisdiction thereof in the same sense as all other uh, aliens residing in the United States. That's from Yik Wo versus Hopkins, 1886. So read that again. Uh, it's true so long as uh, you know they owe allegiance to or obedient to the law, uh, obedient to the law uh, so, obedient to the law, which is part of jurisdiction, but owe allegiance to, in this case a temporary allegiance to, the United States government, so long as they are permitted by the United States to reside here. That language right there is more than sufficient to narrow the previous thing where it says without respect to residence, without respect to domiciliation, which just means whether or not they've been invited to live here permanently. It's saying that, so now if you contemplate the class of people who are here, um, but don't reside here, uh, you know, by invitation to the government. What then? And, and that language seems to suggest that if if you don't reside here, or and you're not here with the per permission of the United States, a different result might uh, come out. But whatever else is true, that so long as they remain here with the permission of the United States, uh, then you get this result. So that leaves entirely open the question of what happens with respect to illegal aliens, uh, the children of Ill illegal aliens, born on American soil, or at least some subsets of American soil. And I think that the right legal, the, the right constitutional answer is they're not citizens. Um, the, the law that is written on birthright citizenship seems to exclude lots of cases by, explicit, by explicitly including only certain cases. And so when I hear that the president can't do this by executive order, it strikes me as a little strange because the only thing that has been granting these, uh, these kids of illegal aliens citizenship is an opinion and action by the executive. And it's a well-established principle that whatever the executive does lawfully within his power, he can choose to do the exact opposite later on. A current president cannot bind the action, the constitutional uh, power, uh, how a future president will exercise the same power. So this one president has this, this policy that he prefers. Fine. It is not a one-way ratchet. The preference of this policy does not mean that the next uh, president doesn't get to say, well, you know, I respect my, my predecessor. He had one view of it. I have the opposite view. I'm changing policy. The, the president's perfectly free to do that. There is no provision of, of, of law. There's no statute of Congress that prohibits it. And the only thing that has ever given these people citizenship or purports to give these people citizenship is action by the executive, which action he's free to uh, change course on tomorrow. As I mentioned, uh, it is not a one-way ratchet any more than the Congress enacting a statute today prohibits this, uh, the next Congress, or even the same Congress, from changing that law tomorrow. Whatever's within its proper power to legislate today, it can, on a lark, change the day after. If, well, you know, we thought about it. Uh, we don't know what we were thinking. We've decided our, to change our mind. But in any event, they can't stop the next Congress from changing its view. And the same thing with the court decisions. Anything that's proper within the power of the court to decide, uh, if after, the, you know, some years go by and it thinks more carefully about the case and decides this isn't workable, and, you know, I don't know what they were thinking. It doesn't make any sense. It's not working out. It's crazy. It's creating confusion. We've changed our mind. They're perfectly free to do it. The uh, Although, I will mention with the courts, they have precedent where future courts are at least nominally bound by the decisions of past courts, which is to say that you don't overturn past decisions on a whim. There's got to be a really compelling reason to do it. And on that point, I will, I will uh, note that the Elk case, the, uh, the, the Indian case, has been cited by lower court judges in lots of different cases on citizen letting in citizens from our outlying territories and in other cases. And they say, look, even though a statute of Congress has been passed that says Indians, now you get citizenship, 
that doesn't answer the constitutional question. And uh, Elks v. Wilkins is still good law. It's still binding precedent. Uh, we lower court judges aren't free to ignore it. The only people who can change it would be the, the Supreme Court uh, deciding to overturn Elks or the American people ratifying an amendment to the Constitution that repeals it. Until either of those things happens, it's still good law. It's still binding on us. And the, the rationale that led to the conclusion, no, is still fully binding on us, which means that there has to be an allegiance test there. It's not simply, are you physically present in the United States under any possible set of circumstances? That's the law. If you don't like it, I hate it for you. But it'll be a very interesting ride to see uh, what will happen if he does sign this executive order. Have a great day.